in the Lake Forest. Uh, if you guys have been here at all over the summer, then you will know for right now, you guys can uh, remain seated as we, as we kind of have a little, a little prelude to get things started. We have each week been just taking just a moment before we start and uh, sing, sing a song that has something to do with where we're going for the day. Uh, so today we have a guest teacher coming in for us, Pastor Michael Flake from Davidson is coming to teach, and he's, he's going to teach to us this morning about, yeah, that's right, got some, got some woos out there from Michael Flake, uh, to teach us about what the Proverbs have to say about our money and the way we use it, uh, and what, uh, how we hold on to our money. So we, we like wrestle with a couple ideas, and um, so we, we figured we would just try a couple things to kind of see what sticks this morning. So here's the first idea that we had when it comes to songs about money. It goes like this. One. Looking a little deeper, that song is about uh, armed robbery. Thought maybe don't go that direction. I, I was more like a child of the 90s, so after digging a little, I said we should skip that one. We'll do a hard turn away from that one there. So we kept thinking, and then we we, we thought about this one might be worth a shot. One. I like it though. No. no, it's good. He knew that without me telling him to do that. I promise you, it was awesome. <laughs> he knew that before we even started. So we said, okay, maybe maybe not that one. Although it sounded really great. We thought uh, there's 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 another direction that we could try. We already did one from this band, but I mean, this I think about this. When I think about money songs. It goes like this. It goes, and I don't care too much for money. Cause money can't buy me love. Can't buy me love. But at the end of the day, there was just one that stood out. We're here in Lake Norman. Like, this is the song about money that we had to do. So it goes like this. I know everybody says money can't buy happiness. But it can buy me a place. It can buy me a show. It can buy me a shirt. All right, I know that's just what you were expecting to get things started this morning. Why don't we stand as we get ready to roll in for real as we uh, gather for the reason that we are gathered, which is to sing about a God that loves us so much and we see his grace on display all around us and in our lives. We're going to sing, we're going to worship him together this morning. It's good to be here with you. Let's sing together. Mr. 
God, we come to you with thankfulness for all that you've done for us. God, we give you the glory for it this morning. You are good, and we are thankful. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things together. Amen. You can have a seat. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. Welcome to Lake Forest Church. Uh, my name is Jeff Cook. I get to be on the pastoral team here. Uh, and if you are looking to grow in your relationship with God or connecting community here at Lake Forest, I would love to help you. Uh, grab me after service, shoot me an email, whatever works for you. And if this is your first time here, it's important that you know that Lake Forest Church is a safe and encouraging place for people to discover and live out their role in God's story. And I hope that you feel as welcome as you are. Um, you know, when you came in this morning, you should have received a card looks like this. You find a whole bunch of ways to connect with us online. You also find a spot where you can let us know that you are here. But most importantly, on the back is a place where you can tell us how we can be praying for you this week. If you would prefer we pray for you today, right after service, just go out those doors and make a right. There will be men and women ready and able to pray for you down there. If you prefer to just leave it on the card, that's cool too. A little bit later on, uh, the jeans pocket will come around. Just tear off that part of the card and drop it in there. Now that jeans pocket is also one of the five ways that those of us who call Lake Forest home worship God by giving tithes and offerings. Uh, I'd just like to share with you a couple things going on uh, in and around the church. We're, we're partnering uh, with Caterpillar Ministries to put on, this is the fourth year, to put on a soccer camp called One Team. That happens in two weeks, right? And, and not only is it affordable fun for children and youth, but it's a chance for our LFC tribe to continue to grow in building cross-cultural friendships and relationships with our Hispanic neighbors in Huntington Green. So we would love it if you would get involved. There are three main ways you can do that. First, if you have a kid who is a rising kindergartner through senior, sign them up. Uh, if, if you want, you can sign yourself up, not to play soccer, um, but you can be a, a camp coach, you can be a counselor, you can be on the hospitality team, serve one day, serve many days, uh, whatever it is, we just, we'd love for you to be involved. Uh, and finally, you could give. Right? You, you could give financially, you could donate goods. There's a lot of material needs for this camp. Um, there are going to be flyers like this right out on that table. Please grab one on your way out and check it out. Uh, another organization we partner with and have for years is the Charlotte Rescue Mission. If you don't know anything about them, all you need to know is that the work that they are doing with the homeless and addicted folks down in Charlotte there, is, it's unmatched in our area. And so we're delighted that we get to partner with them. They have an organization called the Dove's Nest, uh, a facility rather, that serves women who are being treated for addiction and their children. Uh, we've got a group of women from Lake Forest that go there monthly and serve and connect, and they have decided to kind of open that up for more women to learn about it if they want to get involved. So August 5th, there's going to be a, like a lunch and learn. Uh, if that sounds like you, then I want you to mark your calendar. All the details and the RSVP are all at lakeforest.org backslash events. Uh, now for our men, there is this thing that has started up couple months ago maybe, uh, on Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. right out by the fireplace called the Men's Prayer Gathering. And it is exactly that, right? It's just men gathering to pray with and for each other. Um, you don't have to be registered. You don't have to be a prayer warrior. You just have to be a man who's willing to lean on God. And as a man who prays, I would like to encourage any and every man in this room to attend it. I promise you, you will not be sorry. Finally, I want to offer a personal invitation at 1230 today, right after this service, we're going to have a talk back session right out in Define Coffee. Great place for you to bring your questions, your concerns, your doubts. It's, it's just practical conversation about God's wisdom. Right, and, and that fits with what we've been doing this summer. We've been looking at Proverbs, which is this collection of godly practical wisdom and have heard from a collection of preachers. Right now, you may not know that the main reason for that is that our lead pastor, Mike Moses, has been on sabbatical leave since May. We're totally stoked to welcome him back August 1st. Uh, but for now, we get the privilege this, this day of hearing from Michael Flake, who is our lead pastor of Lake Forest Davidson. And anytime we have Mike here, it, like it's a joy. And if you don't know what I mean, it's because you haven't heard him and you'll get it once you do. Uh, but before we get to that, why don't we stand again and spend a little more time worshiping God.
continue our worship together through giving. So let's give as we continue to sing. Thank God for what he's done. poured out for us the weight of every 
let us stand on your promises so that whether we're uh, on the mountaintop or in the valley though we would know that your character doesn't change what you've told us about yourself doesn't change and we know that you're there and you are good we thank you that neither life nor death nor anything we can encounter can separate us from your let us lean into that this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. The book of Proverbs is a collection of wisdom that has guided God's people for thousands of years. The Proverbs promote a life of virtue and fear of the Lord, which is really just another way of saying awe of God or a holy respect for God. So this summer, let's discover what God's Word has to say about relationships, work, discipline, speech, and more in the book of Proverbs. This is a word to the wise. Well, good morning. I'm Michael Flake, uh, one of the pastors at Lake Forest. They call me the lead pastor of Lake Forest Davidson. It is good to be with you today. As you could probably deduce, I am not in Davidson. I don't know who's in charge at Lake Forest Davidson today. So if I get a text in the middle of the service and run out the door, you'll know what happened. It's great to be here continuing in a summer series on the book of Proverbs as the video said we have this summer throughout all the three Lake Forest churches been studying the book of Proverbs. Proverbs' main desire is that you and I would be wise, that we would live well, that we would live wisely in this life that God has given to us. And so we're exploring some of the major themes of Proverbs. Today I am going to walk us through one of the major themes of Proverbs, which is the theme, the topic of finances finances. Now, finances can be a source of great anxiety for many of us. In other news, the Pope is Catholic, right? You, you already knew that. Finances can be a source of a lot of friction, a lot of arguments within marriages or within families. Some people leave their churches because they talk too much about money. And that may be the case, and it may also be true that some folks are hypersensitive about money so that if you bring it up once, that constitutes talking too much about money. Now, I'm not convinced that our finances are any more out of control than the other parts of our lives. It's just that we can't hide from the numbers, right? Every week, every month, every year, the numbers tell us if we're doing a good job. And the numbers do not lie, although sometimes we sort of encourage or would like the numbers to lie. And then this strange thing happens. You will meet someone, and they have pretty well wrangled their finances. And they act like money is no big deal. They have become good managers of the finances God has entrusted to them. Money seems to cause them very little to no anxiety. And it's not really that they have more money than we do, it's that they manage it well. They see it as a gift from God and they manage God's gift well. Proverbs 13, 7 says, one person pretends to be rich yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor yet has great wealth. When it comes to finances, God is teaching us that there is perception and there is reality. So is your view and my view of finances based on perception or on reality? Some years ago, a consulting group gathered together. They had an event. They gathered together a number of millionaires so that they could learn more about these millionaires. And I'm sure in the end, like, try to sell them stuff. But the initial event was just to try to learn more about them. 
And so they did all the right things. They bought fancy wines. They bought fancy cheeses. They bought crackers for the fancy cheeses. And then the millionaires all showed up. They came in slick-looking cars. They had on slick-looking suits. I don't know why I motioned to my clothing when I said slick-looking <laughs> suits, but I did. So the millionaires showed up. They drank the wine. They ate the cheeses. They talked to the consultants, and then they left. Then the consultants started to analyze the information that they had received about these folks, and they realized something very interesting. Almost none of them were millionaires. In fact, some of them had more debts than assets. They, they were not even hundred heirs, but they presented themselves as so. And so the consultants tried again. And this time they invited people that they knew had more than a million dollars on the balance sheet. And they made three observations about them. Number one, they looked uncomfortable in fancy suits. Number two, they only ate the crackers. Number three, most of them had on a $30 wristwatch. The people were so unassuming, the consultants started to call them the millionaires next door. Now, this consulting firm spent a lot of money to learn what God had already revealed to Solomon, and Solomon had passed along to us in the Proverbs, which is when we're talking about finances, there is perception and there is reality. There is appearance and there is substance, and typically they are not the same thing. And so God has set me as a Christian, God has set me free from the need to keep up appearances so that I can instead work on being a person of real substance. So that if you are a Christian, or if you ever become a Christian, if you ever put your faith in Christ, if you ever decide to follow Jesus, God has set you free to be a person of true substance. Not a person bent on keeping up appearances, but a person of true substance. So what we want to do today is to make sure we have a view of finances that is based on substance. The, the wisdom that God reveals to us in the book of Proverbs, not simply on appearances, not simply on glittering images, the glittering images we would see on media or in social media. We want to pay a little less attention to the fancy car, fancy suit view of finances so that we can pay more attention to the $30 wristwatch view of finances. So here we go. Proverbs lists at least four ingredients of well-managed finances. I stopped at four because I thought maybe I'd start to lose you if I did five or six or seven. So we're just going to do four. Four ingredients of well-managed finances. Number one, number one, number, 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 number one. Diligence and ethical work over time. Diligent and ethical work over time. Proverbs 12, 11 says, Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Proverbs 12, 11 is pointing out that get-rich-quick schemes are typically lower on the get-rich-quick and higher on the scheme. The surest way to provide for your needs and the needs of those you love is to work diligently to realize there is no magical way to make a lot of money. It happens one day at a time, one project at a time, one sale at a time. Proverbs 11.1 1 says that the Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor with him. Now, this verse is referring to a business practice of that day and time, similar to how you and I might still buy fruits or vegetables by the pound. In that day, it was very common that you would buy things by weight, and so some merchants had figured out how they could mess with the scales so that you would actually be charged for more than you bought. That was called a dishonest scale. And so Proverbs is pointing out that it's not just about diligent work. It's also about having ethics in your work. It's also about having integrity in your work. That matters as well. That if you go about doing your job immorally or unethically, will God be overly excited to bless you in your work? If you pray, God, please bless me as I tinker with this scale over here, 
Is God going to be overly excited to answer that prayer with a resounding yes? And of course, things that happen in the darkness eventually come into the light. Jail time and lawsuits make it very hard to have well-managed finances. Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Uh, note to self, use the term sluggard whenever possible. <laughs> so in Proverbs, a sluggard is someone who simply does not want to work, somebody who is lazy. And Proverbs says that over time, most sluggards will become poor. That does not mean that most poor people are lazy. It means that most lazy people become poor. This is an important difference because honestly, most of the people I know in poverty work really hard to simply stay afloat. So in this passage, Solomon is urging lazy folks to learn from ants. In fact, all of us can learn from ants. How do ants prepare for the future? One crumb at a time, right? When you or I are there eating at the Taco Bell and we drop a crumb, what happens? An ant comes and grabs it and carries it off <laughs> if the rat doesn't get it first. And so ants have enough for winter. They have enough to make it through the winter because they work day after day after day. In other words, there is really no magic way to make a lot of money. The chief way that we provide for our needs and the needs of people under our care is to work diligently, to work day after day after day, assembling crumbs over time through diligent ethical work. Number two, generosity to God's work and to those in need. Ingredients of well-managed finances. Number two, generosity to God's work and those in need. Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, this is a strange combination of ingredients. So far, Proverbs has said, Diligent ethical work coupled with generosity to God's work and those in need. God is pointing out the importance of coupling a sweaty brow with an open hand. That it's through the open hand of generosity that we help others, and in helping others, we actually discover that we are helping ourselves. We refresh others, and we find ourselves refreshed. So the, sometimes you will hear the expression, to give till it hurts, but I think the Bible's take is more so that you and I should give till it feels good. Proverbs eleven twenty six says, people curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing on the one who is willing to sell. That's an interesting point, isn't it? Like how many people we're praying for God to bless Mr. Scrooge. Not, probably not many people at all. Maybe praying that someone would uh, empty their chamber pot on Mr. Scrooge, but, but not praying that God would bless Mr. Scrooge. But people do pray for God to bless those who don't hoard what they have, those who are willing to share, those who are willing to sell it, those who are willing to give it so that others can have something as well. Now, I will be the first to tell you, I don't pretend to know how all the ins and outs work when somebody prays for God to bless you. I was not at that planning meeting. I don't know how it all works. But I do know this, it cannot hurt. Somebody prays for God to bless you, it cannot hurt. And so it's the open-handed generosity that causes more people to pray for God to bless you. Proverbs 19, 17 continues in that vein when it says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. He will reward them for what they have done. Throughout the Bible, it is clear that God takes a special interest in the welfare of people who are experiencing poverty.